Good evening. We are in our class on 1 John, so not the Gospel of John, but the letters towards the back, closer to Revelation. 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. We're looking at 1 John. And we did chapter 1 already when Rick was here. And that's been two and a half weeks ago because of the gospel meeting and then the switching from Sunday to Wednesday. So it might be worth a moment to think about what's this? What is this? What is 1 John? <laughs> what's it about? Why is this written? Anybody remember? Let's we'll start with a real easy one. Who wrote it? John, just like the title. There's some discussion over, you know, precisely who is it the same John as with Jesus? I, I think it is. There's some different ideas about that. Um, and who was it written to? It doesn't start out, if you look at the beginning, it doesn't start out like Paul's letters. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the church at Corinth or whatever. He doesn't say that. Uh, I think the idea is, uh, based on broader context, probably to the, the area of Turkey. Actually, the same area that the churches of Revelation, those seven churches that are addressed there, that seems to be where John was working. and So that's probably some folks in that region. Cause he was, John was based in Ephesus, I believe, and that's in, in the midst of all that. And what's the... Why did he write this letter? The just, uh, hey, how are you guys doing? Kind of letter, or well, I guess he wanted to remind people about who Jesus was. To remind people who Jesus was. Yeah. Yeah, and it seems like there there perhaps were some specific problems they had that he addresses. You know the based on the fact that he brings these things up, it seems to be reacting to some problems there. And he even mentions some false teachers and deceivers. So it's clear that there's some folks causing problems and he's trying to correct some things. So, so real quickly thinking about First uh, John chapter 1, basically, as you said, Addy, G- Jesus, remember Jesus, he's, he's real. John speaking, you know, I saw him. I'm an eyewitness. I... I touched him, I heard him. And that was apparently one of the, the issues, maybe, was that uh, there were some false teachers who were saying, well, Jesus was just sort of a spirit. He wasn't really a you know, flesh and bones person like we are. Uh, John is denying that. Jesus came in the flesh, and, and he touched him. Verses 5 through 10 kind of get into this light and dark business which is a theme of the book and really a theme of the way John writes. Uh, you know, if we, if we walk with, with God, then we're in fellowship with God, but if we're, if we're not, then we're lying, those sorts of things. Uh, it mentions Jesus' blood cleansing us from sin and, and how we can confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us. You know, that basically we shouldn't lie. We should re- recognize that we have sin and confess our sins. Because if we pretend we don't have sins and and then don't address that by not confessing them, then we're in a bad state. And that kind of gets us to chapter 2 where we are. Uh, And I've got the workbook here on the screen. Um, I'll just read that first little section there. It says, we have an advocate who is also the propitiation for our sins. And to truly know him, we must keep his commandments, especially to love one another. Describing his uh, original reader's spiritual state. Uh, John cautions against loving the world and being deceived by antichrists by letting truth abide in them and they abiding in Christ. So some of those words are worth thinking about. So Christ is our advocate or our helper, maybe our intercessor. He's he's there to uh, speak for us since he's bought us with his blood, so he's our advocate. What's another way to describe propitiation? Propitiation, that's a word you, you don't use every day. It's a perfect sacrifice for sin. A perfect sacrifice for sin. So that, that whole business where Jesus died for us on the cross and, and that was to pay for our sins, that's the propitiation. That's the idea. 
the, atone, the atonement, the atoning sacrifice. Okay? Points to ponder, as this book tells us, the true test of knowing Jesus as our advocate and our propitiation is one of the themes here. Uh, things in the world we cannot love, being against worldliness, and uh, the identity of the Antichrist in the writings of John. So, if we think about what are the main points of this chapter, it's kind of what we just read in that, that opening paragraph, uh, that Christ is our advocate uh, and how, how we need to know him. Uh, this, this idea of a, a new commandment of loving one another. Um, some, some thought about this, the spiritual state of the Christians and how they're in Christ. Uh, loving, not loving the world and, and being beware of the Antichrist. And then just abiding in Christ, abiding in truth, and, and abiding in all that. Let Christ abide in us and we abide in him. All those ideas. Uh, other thoughts that maybe thoughts that you answered for that question about the main points of the chapter? All right. Number two. And let's just start reading this here. Uh, and I've got it up over here. Let's just read the couple, first couple of verses. That's what uh, this question two asks us about. So 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. This is the English Standard Version I'm reading from. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So, how can Jesus be of aid to us when we have sinned? So imagine, maybe you don't have to imagine too hard. Think back when you most recently sinned. What's Jesus good for for you? What's, what's the point? You can ask him for forgiveness. Yeah. We have an advocate with the Father. So there's a sense in which he's there at the right hand of God saying, you know, well, I, my blood is on him, you know. I died, I died for Caleb, Jesus saying, you know. Or I died for Elaine, Eileen, all of us. Jesus looks and, and defends us because he's our advocate. It's just like in the Yeah, and if you didn't hear that, she was saying that uh, Jesus is, this, in a sense, like our lawyer in the courtroom defending us. Like, imagine some of the courtroom scenes we see on TV, and the person who's being tried typically has the smart sense and not trying to defend themselves, and they have a smart lawyer that has the, the right things to say. And, of course, Jesus is a very smart lawyer, and, and he uh, not only is smart, but he also actually took the penalty for our sin upon himself. So that's the, that's the pleading he can make. Well, that's, that's been paid for. I, I paid for that on the cross. So there you go. We want to have that, as, him as our advocate. So he's our advocate and he's our propitiation all in one. So he's our advocate because he's our propitiation, because he died for our, our sins. Other thoughts about how how Jesus can be of aid when we've sinned. Yes. Right. So if we're maybe caught up in sin and depressed and feeling like we don't know where to go, if we turn to the Word, which He re revealed to us, that can help get us back on track and encourage us. Yes. 
1 Peter 5, 7, it says, Call on, well, thanks for your care on him, that's Jesus, for he cares for you. Cast all our cares on Jesus because he cares for us. That's right. Okay. Well, let's look at the, uh, the next question here. And the question, well, we'll just read the question to have it in mind and we'll read the verses. What are, the, are two proofs that we know Jesus and that we abide in him? So let's read verses 3 through 6. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So what are two proofs that we know Jesus and that we abide in him? And they kind of sound like the same answer, almost. <laughs> you just need to keep his commandments, and that way we abide, abide in him. Yeah. If you love me, you keep my commandments. Yeah, just keeping his commandments, right? So these Christians that John is writing to, they need to not stray away from Christ's teaching, but rather they need to keep his commandments. And by extension, that obviously applies to us as well. We need to keep his commandments. And walk as he walks. That's right. Um, walking as he walked. That's a, a tall order, isn't it? We ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. All right. Thoughts on that? That's a tall order. <laughs> yes. Yes. How are you doing? Uh, walking in the same way in which he, he walked. Yeah, yeah. And we try, and we need to keep trying, and need to encourage each other in that, right? We find that uh, it's narrow and a wide place, so we need to walk in a narrow place. Yeah. And as it says, we, we ought to walk in the way in which he walks, somewhat acknowledging that we're not Christ, we're not perfect, but that's what we're called to do, to work on. Okay? Other thoughts on that? All right, number four. What commandment is both old and new? And what in the world does that mean? Because that sounds like two different things. Let's look at verses 7 through 11. First John 2, verse 7. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Okay? Light and dark, new and old. What commandment is both old and new? What's that? Love. Love. Yeah. Loving, loving others. Um, loving your brother. Because that's what he, he goes on to talk about how, uh, you know, if you, if you hate your brother, you're walking in darkness, right? Now, if we go back to John 13, John 13, verse 
John 13, 34. This is, of course, back in the Gospel of John where Jesus' story is being told. And, and Jesus says, a new commandment I give you. That sounds familiar, right? The new and the not new, right? A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, was that the first time in the Bible that anyone's ever had a concept that they should love their brother? <laughs> is, that, is that completely new? I mean, that's kind of a, you know, Cain wasn't supposed to kill Abel because you're supposed to love your brother, right? That's basic stuff. But isn't it kind of taken to a different level here in Christ? Just as I have loved you. Now, who, who else died for someone like Jesus? Did? I think Jesus is unique in that. He died for the sins of the world. And he's calling us to love like that. Well, again, we're to, to walk the way he walked. It's a tall order. So it's, a, it's called the new commandment here in John 13. Yes. Yeah, I think that might even be here later on in our text. Yeah, that's... Because John, especially here in First John, he just kind of goes around and round and round. He comes back to the same things. Uh, it doesn't really... It's not like, well, chapter one's about loving your brother and chapter two is about remaining in Christ. It's just he goes through these themes and just kind of cycles through them over and over. So, good thought. So, did we answer the question? What commandment is both old and new? Loving, loving your, your neighbor, loving your brother. Does it make sense that it's old and new? Does that throw you for a loop? Kind of, kind of did me the first time I read that. Okay, well the next question looks at verses 12 through 14, I guess I should bring that up here. <clears throat> List three groups of people and how John describes their spiritual state. So here we've got this list of people in verses 12 through 14, even in this list it kind of circles around like I was just describing, it comes back to the same group of people again and again here in this. So let's read uh, verses 12 through 14. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. So our question is, what are the three groups, and how does John describe their spiritual state, each of those three groups? What's one of the groups? Little children. Little children? Okay. Right there. And, and he said, mentions that in verse 12. And in verse, well, 13. I think actually different translations have it in a different place. Verse 14 or 13. Children, because they have known the Father. Mm -hmm. The children, uh, they've had their sins forgiven. For his name's sake, and they and they have known the Father, or or they know the Father. Okay, and it's interesting. In in the Greek, it's actually two different words. And in, in the English Standard Version, it says "little children" in verse twelve, and in verse thirteen, it says "children." And there's not an adjective; it's just a different word. That's probably the difference between children and kids. It's kind of a synonym. Okay. So what about the second group? 
There's the little children. Who else does he write to? Fathers. Fathers and the young men. So what's the deal with the fathers? What does he say to the fathers? The fathers have known him from the beginning. And he mentions that twice, doesn't he? Um, I kind of made some marks in my Bible and like linked these things up and these repetitions and stuff. Um, he says, I am writing to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. And he says that twice. Who is from the beginning? Christ? Or God the Father? Or the Holy Spirit? Or, or both? Or all three? <laughs> right? John likes to blur those lines, I think, sometimes. You're like, well, who are you, who are you talking about, John, precisely? And are you talking about God, the Father, or Jesus, the Son? And the answer is yes. <laughs> yes. So just go with that. Okay. All right, what about the other group? Mentioned young men. What, what, what's said about the young men? They're, they're strong, and what's that? They've overcome or they've conquered the evil one. Who, what's the evil one? Who's the evil one? Satan, Satan right? So in everything he represents, there's a passage that even calls him the God of this world, which seems a little blasphemous, but it's the sense in which of this world, of this the worldliness, right? He's sort of a, a, in charge of the worldliness in a negative way. But those Christians, those young men who've become Christians have overcome that. Yes? I was thinking what you're talking about is all this young people in the church. He's not talking about the people who are weak. Well, he's talking to three different groups, isn't he? Yeah. He's talking to little children and fathers and young men. So, but, but the young men, he is saying that they're strong. But you might take a step back and like, well, wait a minute. Are we talking about like I'm a I'm a father because I have Caleb, <laughs> and Caleb's a young man and uh, little children. Maybe we don't have any little children, but is that what we're talking about? Surely. Okay, so perhaps little children is referring to someone new in the faith. So maybe these different roles in this list of three types of people are about the level of maturity in their Christian life. You know, I'll point your attention back to the very first word in this chapter where John addresses these people, my little children, I am writing these things to you. Seemingly like that's like all of them. At least that's how I take it. But then he's zeroing in on it here, sort of differentiating little children and fathers and the young men. Other thoughts on that? Well, yes? You know, even like a teacher. Uh, a teacher will uh, make comments about their children, and they're talking about their students. And mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, little little toddlers and babies. Yeah, I think it's more of what you're saying. It's different different stages of a Christian's life. There's some new Christians, and there's some people like Paul, who like Timoth Timothy, and he considered him the father of Timothy, right? There's some mentors, and then there's some Timothys who are maybe the young men. Um, yeah, you know, if you go to jump a moment to 2nd John and 3rd John, there's just one page in my Bible he refers to himself, so that they are more formulated like letters where, you know, Paul, an apostle Jesus Christ, the church at Corinth, right he says, the elder to the elect lady, so the author, John, is calling himself the elder, 
does the same thing in Third John, the elder to the beloved Gaius. So, so John's calling himself the elder. So if we extrapolate that to First John, written by the elder, you know, he's he's a kind of that mentor. He's an apostle, and so he's he's mentoring and training these other Christians. So at some points, he seems to call all of them little children or his children. And then he seems to be di- differentiating here maybe a little more detail in verses 12 through 14. Does that help? I don't know. <laughs> yeah? Other thoughts? Yeah? We're more than conquerors through Christ, right? And so he's bringing some of Paul's language in here. So it's not just that that uh, we overcome because we're so great. And maybe that's what a young man will often think. Well, I can do anything. I'm invincible. <laughs> but all of this is through Christ. By abiding in Christ, abiding in the Word, and keeping the commandments. By doing those things, then then we uh, we have Christ, the Advocate, and we overcome the evil one because. Jumping to Revelation, you know, the, the book of Revelation, the theme is Christ wins. So the action item is, so be on Christ's team so you win with him. And that's the way we overcome the evil one. We need to be on his team to be faithful. Other thoughts on that? Okay, so we've got all three groups, right? All right, number six. What three things in the world should we not love? There's only three things. What are three things in verses 15 through 17? Let's just read it real fast, and then you've already got the answer, I'm sure. (laughs) First John 2, 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away, along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. So again, that's how we remain in Christ, right? So, what were the three things? (laughs) And For God. You forgot? <laughs> the pride of life and the lust of the flesh. And yeah. Uh, I wrote a different if the other one. Okay. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, or different translations. Maybe say vainglory of life, I think. Well, you know, if you look at the world and some of the things that go around you, it's easy to get caught up in some of this stuff. It looks good. Yeah, then, and from the very beginning, we're deceived, right? We can even go back to Genesis 3 6. I feel like we even see the same concepts there. The whole deal with uh, the fall of man, right? In the Garden of Eden. So in Genesis 3 6, so when the woman, when Eve, when woman, the woman saw that the tree that the serpent was tempting her about, she saw that it was good for food. It's kind of like the lust of the flesh. And it was, uh, let's see, I lost my splice. <laughs> it was good for food, and it was a delight to the eyes, so that's the, the lust of the <laughs> eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, and that seems to correspond to the pride of life. I want to I be wise, I want to know the good and evil, I want to know all the things. So she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. So they both they both got caught up in the wrong thing. And it kind of comes down to those three things. You, you kind of think maybe through some things that you struggle with, you can probably dump, dump it into one of those three categories. That's, that's how it works. All right. Other thoughts on the three things that we should not love? 
All right. What does John reveal about Antichrist? Well, we had a lesson about that, didn't we? Didn't uh, Dave Tenney gave us a lesson about that? Let's look to down to verse 18 through 23. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they all are not of us. But you have been anointed. Uh, how come we're supposed to read here? 23. But, but you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you, not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. Which is it? Father of the Son? Yes. Uh, 23. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. So, the question, what does John reveal about Antichrist? Because that's a big mystery today, right? We don't know who that is. It's Ronald Reagan, or it's Adolf Hitler. What, what does it say here? We're looking for the one Antichrist. Yeah. You know, in man thinking, in which we get the Antichrist, then he'll come to the beginning. And anyone can deny Jesus. Right. Even, even uh, Peter was called by Jesus, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. He <laughs> wasn't called the Antichrist per se, but he was against what Christ was trying to do. So if we're against what Christ is trying to do, we're an enemy of God. And if we're either putting our place, ourself in the place of Christ, well, I'm, I'm the Messiah or something, or if we're just denying everything about Christ, then we are, we, we ourselves can be the Antichrist. People that do that. All the different people that do that are the Antichrist. Okay? Well, we're about out of time, but we have one question left. Why don't we just knock that out? How can we be sure that, uh, that we will abide in the Son and in the Father? Let's just read that real quick, 24 through 29. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you have received from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, and is true, and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know, if you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. So, How can we be sure that we will abide in the Son and in the Father? We can remain faithful and study and in the Yeah. To abide in Him, to remain in Him, to walk in His ways and keep His commandments. Abiding in the truth spoken from the beginning and practicing righteousness. These things that we've read about. And again, John just kind of goes over that same material again and again. Love your brother. Don't hate him. Abide in Christ. Keep the commandments. Follow him. All right, so we'll pick up Lord willing uh, next week in chapter 3.
So for an invitation, <coughs> I just want to really just stay where we right where we are here in uh, First John chapter two. Maybe in a sense, start over. It says here in First John chapter two, my little children. I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation or the atoning sacrifice for our sins. He paid the price for our sins through his death. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And so, this is John writing to church or churches as an apostle he had some oversight over encouraging them to not sin and the same idea goes for us you know we need to we need to not sin we need to we we can't just continue in sin that grace may abound as, as Paul says absolutely not we are to put effort into walking like Christ to not sin but if anyone does sin Recognizing we're human, just like Adam and Eve. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous. Is it, is it Matt that bore the righteous? Is it Jim Klein, the righteous? Jesus Christ, the righteous, the righteous one. The only one who ever walked the earth in a human body and did that without sin is Jesus Christ. We have an advocate in him. Not just an advocate that he's going to say nice things for us, but he paid the price for our sins. That's what the propitiation means. And so we can rest comfortably in that, in a sense. Not that we rest on our laurels and don't try to walk in him. We need to continue to walk in him and continue in his word and keep his commandments. But we can have confidence that the blood of Christ is effective. And it's one thing for us to personally and as a group of Christians here in this building think about that, but we need to recognize it's not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. A famous passage we often hear quoted in John 3.16, For God so loved the world, the whole world, that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. It's not just for, for those who are here. But everyone who, in believing faith, in obedient faith, in a life of faithfulness, walking in Him, all the things that we've talked about, we need to be buried with Him in baptism if we've never been a Christian. That's how we become a Christian. And then we need to continue to walk in Him. So if there's anything that we can help you with tonight, we're going to sing the song. Prepare to meet by God. Have you prepared? Are you prepared? If not, I encourage you to respond to the invitation as we sing the song together.